All right. Hi there, everybody. Hi there, Unite for Her community. Welcome to this month's Ask the Expert. My name is Sue Weldon. I am the founder and CEO of Unite for Her. And I always enjoy hosting these, especially when we have such interesting guests. We're so honored to have this platform that we do every month. And it really brings topics front of mind that are important to our Unite for Her community. So here we are. And um, just remember that today is like a Q&A type of style. So we are live on Facebook. You can do your questions there and I'll see them so I can ask our guests today and comment uh, via the chat. Um, all good. And for this month's Ask the Experts, Dr. Neil Tong from University of Pennsylvania will be answering your common questions about high dose radiation and when it might be best used in the care of patients with metastatic breast cancer. Now, remember, our Ask the Experts is a part of our digital education series, and it is supported by our 2022 education sponsors. Today's presenting sponsor is Merck, and our supporting sponsor is Daiichi Sanko. I also wanted to give a couple reminders. We do these every month. We have some really great topics. So if you want to save the date, mark your calendar. July the 28th at one o'clock, we're going to be having our Ask the Experts feature CEO and founder of X-Ray for Sue Friedman. She's going to be sharing her initiative called Boast. It's ways to like spot red flags and find reliable information online, spot worthy information. This series is it's so valuable. We've actually heard her already at one of our other conferences. And um, we all know how overwhelming it can be, you know, and how to navigate those headlines and that misleading information that sends you down a rabbit hole. So that is the 28th of July. And then in August, we actually have the pleasure of having our very own Jolene Hart. Unite for Her Beauty Advisor and best-selling author of the Eat Pretty book series. She's going to be our host. Uh, she'll be interviewing a celebrity makeup artist, Kareem Orange, to discuss clean beauty for women of color. That date, please save for Sunday, August 28th at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. More details will come on that. All right. Now to introduce our guest for today, I'm going to pop him front and center in the stream. And let me get you there. Hi there, Dr. Tonk. How are you? So good to see you. Good afternoon. Thanks for having me on. Well, thanks for running all over. You've been running all over today. I know you're the only one on call. So thank you for joining us. We're a little bit behind, but our, our community waits for us. So we never mind. A little bit of a bio on Dr. Tonk. So he is an assistant professor of radiation oncology and radiology at the University of Pennsylvania. He completed his residency training at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center and medical school and graduate school at Rutgers University, Robert Wood Johnson. His clinical interests are in breast and prostate cancer. So please join me as we welcome Dr. Tonk for today's Q&A. So I think we're just going to get right to it. I'm going to put you front and center. Um, that way, we'll have everything directed to you. Again, know that we can use the chat. I already have questions that have come in, Dr. Tonk, over the week on this subject. And just so grateful that you'll sort of just give us a nice overview and an even like a leveling of the field so we understand the topic well. So the first one that we have coming up as one of the questions is basically, what is SBRT? or S-A-B-R. Great, thanks so much. And thanks so much for inviting me to join. Um, uh, the community that you have is incredibly well-informed and shares a ton of information. So I hope to, to educate um, the community further. I hope this inspires some discussion uh, as well amongst the members. And, and if you could walk away just learning a little bit more about, about yourselves, that, that, that's just fantastic. Yep. So the, the first question, uh, Sue, that you asked was, what is SBRT or SABR? SBRT stands for Stereotactic Body Radiotherapy. SABR stands for Stereotactic Ablative Radiation Therapy. These are functionally interchangeable sets of terms. And the goal of both of these styles of treatment is to offer ultra high dose, ultra targeted external beam radiation that is designed to ablate or completely eradicate or ideally eradicate the target. So SBRT and SABR are often functionally used interchangeably. They are a collection of techniques and principles to safely deliver ultra high dose targeted radiation to tumors that we can see anywhere in the body. 
Great. And can you tell me how many treatments is that normally? So SBRT and, and SABR are, are more of a collection of techniques. And these techniques are principles of using a very robust type of immobilization. So a more custom body mold than maybe, maybe even more custom than, than some of the members on this uh, uh, call have been in to make sure you're in a really perfect position every day. And then using daily image guidance. So a pre-treatment mini CAT scan or x-rays to make sure that we can deliver within millimeter precision in the body. So it's this collection of techniques. These techniques yield treatments that are generally delivered in about five treatments or less. They can be one, two, three, four, or five, depending on the clinical need, but generally about five treatments or less using these specialized techniques. Nice. Is the timing like the same, Dr. Tom? Because usually they're, the timing's pretty quick. Is that the same with ablative? Yeah, so let's, um, let's take an example of a, of a patient in our practice who may have early stage breast cancer and what her time on the table might be compared to a patient receiving ablative radiation with us. So um, let's, for example, say it's a, it's a woman receiving prone breast radiation to the whole breast. Maybe she's getting a three-week course of whole breast radiation, which is a fairly typical course for early stage breast cancer. In our practice, uh, she would be in the room for about 10 minutes, should be on the table for about five to seven minutes to receive about one to two minutes of radiation. Okay. A patient receiving ablative radiation or stereotactic radiation may instead spend about 30 minutes in the room. Most of that time, which is about 20 to 25 minutes on the table, is spent making sure that you're first in the perfect position for radiation, then an, a set of x-rays and a mini CAT scan are completed while the patient is on the table. That can take about five minutes. Those x-rays and that, that mini CAT scan have to be checked by a physician, so a physician is readily available and immediately signs off, and then you can turn on the machine. Okay. So it's multiple additional steps to get you to safely receiving that treatment. So about 30 minutes in the room as opposed to 10 to 15. Yeah, thank you. I love the analogy. It just helps us sort of visualize, you know, what that treatment looks like as many of our women are all familiar with. Um, so what is the expected benefit? So local control and does it bend the needle at all for those overall outcomes? Yeah, so the, uh, there has been a lot of talk about stereotactic radiation. Um, let's talk about local control first, and then and then let's talk about bending the needle, which is going to be a little bit more of a nuanced discussion we can we can get into. Okay. In terms of local control, what a a, a generally um, positive thing about breast cancer in terms of receiving radiation is that breast cancer tends to be very responsive to radiation therapy, meaning that it's generally considered a radiosensitive type of tumor as opposed to some other types of cancers. So most breast cancers will respond to radiation in some degree. With high dose or ablative radiation, the local control rates can exceed 90%, sometimes even higher for certain tumors as long as they're not too big. So the control is very high. What that offers is that if we see a, a problem, we can almost always or usually take care of it. Now, the second part of your question, Sue, was about does it bend the needle? does it change a patient's entire trajectory yeah. of what their cancer journey may be? We thought it does, and we still think it does for the right patient, but now we're not so sure. There are some women who have a small number of metastatic lesions that we can ablate, and they may never have new cancer again, and that's the ideal. What we're finding, though, is that most women that we can ablate these these tumors for, they will go on to develop new cancers or new areas of cancer spread. And that may not bend the needle. So still a lot of work to be done to understand who is the right person in which we can, in fact, bend the needle on this for. Okay. Thank you. Um, general side effects, anything, you know, between the two uh, different? So uh, let's use the word, say, standard or conventional radiation versus uh, SBRT as our terms. Um, for standard radiation, generally these are courses of three to five weeks of, of external beam uh, therapy and or, or in partial breast one week, one to five weeks of external therapy. And you find um, more common side effects like skin changes, uh, fatigue, 
uh, breast swelling for those who still have uh, uh, an intact breast. Um, uh, those are very common. Stereotactic radiation has an entirely different side effect profile, and it largely depends on what area of the body is being treated. In a very general sense, there are very few short-term side effects of this type of treatment. One potential side effect for women who have painful bone metastasis, it can increase the rate of pain or the severity of pain for a brief amount of time in a minority of women. But in general, most of these treatments, say ablative radiation to the brain, liver, lung, or bone metastases, most patients will not have any meaningful short-term side effects. What we worry about is meaningful long-term side effects, which depend on the area in which we're treating. So treatment to each one of these areas will yield a slightly different side effect profile long-term. That's why it's very important to be very careful when we deliver this type of treatment. Yeah. And then could you tell me like who is a good candidate or who is not a good candidate? Okay. So ablative radiation is best worked in patients first that have a visible tumor. So say a woman has neoadjuvant chemotherapy and had a visible tumor uh, that was there. We generally do not treat that with ablative radiation because that tumor has gone away. So if there's a visible gross tumor, that gives us a target to treat. The second is if there's a target to treat, then is it safe to treat in that area? Sometimes we will repeat radiation in areas of prior radiation, but oftentimes we won't. So women who've generally not had radiation in an area are perhaps better candidates mm -hmm. than others. It's a little bit safer to deliver it. And then the third, uh, if you can safely treat it and technically treat it, the third consideration is philosophically. And uh, where is the data telling us uh, who is most likely to benefit from this type of treatment? Um, as very extreme examples, and this is not to, to single any member uh, out, a patient that has dozens and dozens and dozens of lesions and a relatively short life expectancy, this might not be the best technique to use. It's time intensive, it's labor intensive, but for a patient that has maybe a few lesions, has a very long life expectancy, understanding that it's very dynamic, mm -hmm. that might be a better candidate. So it's important to have a good discussion with your physicians about about candidacy and, and, and what makes sense in these domains. Having a lesion, is it safe and technically optimal to treat it? And then um, is it right to treat it as well in this manner? Yeah, the size of the lesion matter and when you're treating this? Um, that was, I remember us talking about this briefly a while ago and I felt like I was surprised by the answer. So uh, size depends on the technique that you're using and the location in the body. Uh, in a general sense, tumors that are too big, and too big is a very relative term, become very difficult to control. In addition, it becomes increasingly unsafe to deliver that much radiation to a very large area of disease. Okay. So uh, an example is a, a woman with a two centimeter liver metastasis in a safe spot is going to be a much better candidate than a woman with a 15 centimeter single metastasis that is occupying maybe half the liver. Mm -hmm. There's a significantly increased chance of untoward side effects. Uh, so it depends on the location. Some brain tumors are better than others. Some bone metastases are more suitable than others. I think what it highlights is that um, the larger the lesion, uh, there's a potential increased risk for side effects. There is a potentially decreased likelihood that we can actually control it, which is our goal. Mm -hmm. um, so it is ultimately important to go to a clinic that has a lot of experience uh, understanding where it might be the best and, and, and what size of tumors may not be optimal to do this. Yeah. Well, it sort of leads into our next question because, you know, can any radiation oncologist do this and what should our community look for? So um, this technique is widely available and I would I don't have uh, data to indicate this but at least in our uh, region, and I, I, I live and work in Philadelphia, uh, virtually all clinics near us offer this technique in some degree. They may not treat every single disease site. For example, they may treat um, bone metastasis, but they might not treat specifically spine metastasis with high dose radiation. Um, but most clinics would offer this. The machines to deliver this are linear accelerators. They look very much similar to standard machines that most women who receive breast-related radiation are treated on, but they have to be technically capable. Um, in terms of what you know, our members should look for is, I, I would contend members should look for clinics that have access to clinical trials 
with ablative radiation um, to, to better understand the use of it. And they should go to clinics that are generally more, um, have more experience doing this. For example, clinics that can safely treat lung tumors and liver tumors and bone metastasis and spine mm -hmm. metastasis and brain metastasis. A more experienced clinic is, is more likely to yield a, a safer outcome. Okay. We have quite a few audience questions. So I think I'm going to switch over and do a couple of those now. And because you did talk about um, liver, we were talking mm -hmm. a little bit about that. So the one uh, from our community says, when she was diagnosed, I had an innumerable lesions in my liver and elevated liver enzymes. Mm -hmm. Because of that, my doctor said I was not a candidate for any pr um, procedure for fear of causing liver failure. Would any of these techniques be something I could have had? The chemo cleared the cancer as none can be seen on the scans. However, the left lobe of my liver was severely atrophied and now basically absent. Mm. Her portal vein is now permanently occluded as well. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear that there was some response um, from the chemotherapy, uh, the chemotherapy for, this, uh, for this member. Um, it's difficult to fully assess without taking a really detailed look uh, at the case and the imaging and understanding what the liver function is. And, and it's, uh, it's hard to render a formal opinion, uh, but uh, these techniques can be used in patients with uh, ideally more healthy livers. For example, uh, liver enzymes are not up or not elevated, but they can be used safely in some, uh, some patients that have um, evidence of liver damage. It generally does depend on where the location of the tumor is and is it safe uh, to treat that? In, in a very general sense, uh, women with uh, innumerable liver metastasis are probably not great candidates for high dose targeted radiation because we inadvertently, if we're trying to treat all of these spots, will accidentally or incidentally rather, treat too much normal liver and then we can, we can damage the liver further. There are potentially other techniques, um, including uh, interventional radiology based techniques uh, such as TACE, uh, TEAR, or other types of embolization that could be used and could be done in a staged approach. We often work with different physicians to, to really understand, is there a potentially better approach than, than what we have to offer that might be safer to do? Okay. Yeah, there was another very similar question, and it was about, um, you know, can you get liver ablation regardless of how many METs you have? So I think you basically answered that, you know, but... Um, I think it's really up to uh, individual case, uh -huh. right? And understanding that you're not gonna be damaging any of the positive liver uh -huh. that is left, you know, trying to weigh that. Um, what happens when you have severe burns due to radiation? Mm, okay. So I'm going to um, editorialize the question and, and, and uh, make an assumption that, that this member had uh, uh, skin toxicity or significant skin toxicity um, from external beam uh, radiation. Uh, I'll start with a positive note in that rates of skin toxicity in general are improving for most women. So I don't want to say they're perfect for every woman, but in general, they're improving for most women. That's largely due to the rise of shorter course radiation therapy, uh, which is generally understood to reduce the rate of skin side effects from external beam radiation, as well as some alterations in technique. Um, such as a refined use of something called bolus, which is often associated with lots of peeling uh, from radiation. For women in the short term that have kind of significant skin side effects, uh, peeling, uh, or lots of peeling, discomfort, itching, pain, first thing that can help be helpful is time. You know, in most women, their skin will heal usually within the first four weeks um, of finishing external radiation. And then it takes a lot more time for the tan to go away. And, and some women, it will stay there forever to some degree. Uh, supportive methods that are really helpful that I find uh, um, are things like um, uh, Silvadine cream can be very helpful. It's like Pond's cold cream. It's very soothing. Domboro soaks. That's in a type of an astringent soak that can help keep the skin dry and clean. Uh, cold packs. Uh, cold is surprisingly really nice uh, for, for a sensitive skin wrapping a, an ice pack in a towel and no more than 20 minutes on it uh, at a time. So those are really good supportive things. Um, uh, and uh, 
you know, if, if this question is, is geared towards, say, long-term issues related to skin side effects, that's still really a challenge. You know, yeah. women that have telangiectasias or thready blood vessels from radiation or repeat radiation is really difficult to get that taken away unless visiting with a dermatologist. And patients with significant fibrosis or toughening of the skin related to radiation or repeat radiation, it's really difficult to, to, to take that away. Okay. I know for our community too, we give, I don't know if you're familiar, Dr. Tonk, but we give um, a calendula salve to all of our women. It's in their Beautiful. care box. <laughs> oh, it's so good. The women talk about this nonstop <laughs> and how it has been like just unbelievable at how well it takes away the burn. So it's always good to understand some options and, um, and that's all made, you know, right from the farm and it's a, a really incredible product. Um, this one was about, you know, she was specifically speaking about metastatic breast cancer to the skull. Mm -hmm. So she said, um, when do you know if ablation radiation is the best option versus regular radiation? For um, breast cancer that's metastasized to the skull, we, we consider this, assuming that it's not in the brain or touching the brain or part of the brain going out, we treat it in the same family of bone metastases. And we treat them generally on that prince, on that set of principles. So a, uh, a lesion that is in uh, safe to treat probably has not been uh, radiated before, and potentially a woman with a limited number of lesions that might be ideal. Some special considerations um, for that are: it's really difficult to treat diffuse disease throughout the skull. For example, this is the calvarium, and the skull is is deep inside the head. Um, so it's difficult to treat multiple lesions. It can also be very tricky to treat just because there's a lot of sensitive things nearby in the skull. Um, the brain itself, um, nerves uh, in addition. Um, so there's uh, some sensitivities and some care needed to do that. Um, we can also reduce the dose and give more fractions and that can be a slightly safer approach sometimes. So going a little bit lower and slower might actually be safer than trying to, to give uh, a handful of ultra high dose treatments. Okay, great, thank you. Um, we have a couple more if, if your time is okay. Yeah. Uh, so this one was, um, is there any benefit to ablative radiation when the metastasis is diffused? For example, if the patient has diffused meds throughout several bone areas, would it do good, any good to use radiation on larger meds? Mm -hmm. Um, so this seems to be related to the question about, is there a size limitation? And then the size limitation, again, may mean we need to go a little bit lower and slower than it's supposed to giving ultra high dose treatments. Then the next question is, is, is there a number? Is there a number of lesions that is considered too many? And that is a very unclear number. Some physicians will say maybe three, maybe five, maybe 10. But there are other physicians that will say, if you can safely treat all of it, then that's okay too. And that is often limited, that last one, by, by the abilities of technology and exactly where those lesions are. Um, it's probably best used in, in patients with fewer lesions as opposed to multiple lesions. In a general sense, we can't say for certain. Uh, mostly because if you think about this, like, uh, like the children's game whack-a-mole, um, Ideally, you're trying to get every single spot, but if you can only get one or two, but the others are going to continue to grow and potentially further spread, it begs the question, what are you doing treating just a couple of them? Um, uh, so it does depend on the, on the situation. Um, not, not completely related to this question, Sue, but a fortunate thing is that in a, in a very general sense, the outcomes of women with breast cancer have continued to improve with time. There's a substantial amount of work that still needs to be done, but women with certain types of breast cancer, um, uh, we do not consider this to be an immediately fatal disease, being sensitive to everyone's situation. But many women will live years and years potentially with metastatic disease. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Um, one last question was, um, can this be directed to the retroperitoneal or a periaortic lymph node? Yes, the answer is yes. So let's let's understand what that is yeah. first, or what that area is first. So the retroperitoneum, retro meaning behind, is uh, behind the peritoneal cavity, which is in the in the abdomen. Um, it's kind of in the center of the belly, towards the back, 
somewhere between the, the bones of the spine as and then behind the intestines. That's considered an, a rough area of the retroperitoneum. And then the other term that was used is paraaortic. The aorta is the largest blood vessel in the body. It takes blood from the heart and distributes it around the body. The aorta um, uh, runs through the center back of the abdomen. And just like all blood vessels or all major blood vessels in the body, there are lymph nodes that live along those blood vessels. Um, the short answer is yes. And patients with isolated nodal disease or a handful of spots in those areas, we can safely uh, treat those uh, areas with ablative radiation, assuming it makes sense in the patient's entire disease picture. But yes, yeah, so that's where that location is. And, and in general, yes, we can target it. Yeah. Good. Did I miss anything? That is the last of my question. Did you have anything else that you felt like we might have not touched on from our audience? You, you covered a lot. Well, I have, a, I have a few musings I'd like to share. Yeah. Um, there are, uh, this is an extremely interesting and exciting area of study. And there are multiple clinical trials that are running to help understand and answer is a blade of radiation really the best option or can it really bend the needle in, in uh, different circumstances? Uh, one large study called Sabre Comet has demonstrated a significant benefit to doing this and that benefit has been sustained. However, there was a very small number, a relatively small number of women with breast cancer, or patients with breast cancer on that study. A newer study called Energy br 2 uh, which was presented at ASCO, the annual uh, oncology meeting in Chicago a few weeks ago, demonstrated, and much to our surprise, that there wasn't a significant benefit to doing ablative radiation for women with metastatic disease. And this landed in our community like a big thud. Yeah. It was not what we expected nor hoped. What was heartening in that study was that it was very safe to do. What was also heartening in that study was that the outcomes of women from when that study first opened compared to now has dramatically improved. So we're starting at a brand new baseline and maybe we need to further refine who might be the right patient to do that. So there are some physicians who are offering this a lot less, which is appropriate. There are some physicians that are selecting patients to what they think is better, which is appropriate. But there's multiple additional studies that are running to help understand who is the right type of patient. So if there is a clinical trial available to you and women are, uh, your members are interested in receiving this type of therapy, um, we are big fans of encouraging participation if you choose um, uh, for this. Okay. Thank you. Did you get to ASCO? I know we missed each other. I feel like you were there maybe on Monday, Tuesday. Was that right? I was there for uh, a solid 30 hours. Uh, oh, on the uh, but <laughs> it's it was, overwhelming we, as it is. And then you made it more overwhelming by being there for 30 hours. <laughs> exactly. But ASCO is, is a wonderful meeting oh, and incredible. it was um, back in person and, and just about full force. There's just so much excitement in the community and there was a lot of really wonderful data on, on new breast cancer therapies that were presented that were really exciting. So exciting. Yeah, it was our first one, my first one. And um, I can't wait, you know, to go next year. So many learnings, so many great partners we got to see. It was it was incredible. Really Absolutely. enjoyed it. It's a ton of fun and there's just so much great energy. And I hope you saw that Sue when you were there. Oh, totally. Yeah, it was so good. I couldn't get over the size but I sort of thrive in that overwhelming. So it was all good. It was all good. Well, Dr. Tong, thank you so much for joining us. You're always a wealth of knowledge. We love having you on. You're always receptive to coming on and uh, despite your very busy schedule. So we appreciate that. And um, yeah, you have a good day and we'll, we'll, we'll be back in touch with you soon. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Sue, for, for hosting me and, and for the community to, to welcome, uh, welcome us on. And, and, and I hope you learned something from this session to take away. Yeah, absolutely. And this will, just so the audience knows, this will live on our HER library. You know, we always have it there where people can go back and visit and there's questions. I know Susan actually asked if that was the calendula set from Lancaster Farm Fresh. And yes, it is. They are one of our great partners. And and that is correct, Susan, it was. But we, we have a lot of different topics. It's just a, such a wealth of knowledge. And it's important for us to keep that you know, knowledge in front of our community. Um, we're serving, you know, over 4,000 women a year and men. So it's important for us to make sure we're at the forefront and we have somebody like you that can really break all of this down to us when we hear about these different types of techniques. 
Um, once again, thank, thank you everybody for joining. We always wanna thank our Ask the Experts digital education sponsors, and that is Merck today, as well as Daiichi Sanko, our supporting sponsor. And they help us continue to bring these monthly episodes focusing on topics that are important to the Unite for Her community. Another reminder on July the 28th, as the experts with X-Ray Force and Sue Friedman. And in August, the 28th as well, this one's on a Sunday. And that is with Jolene Hart and interviewing a celebrity makeup artist for uh, Clean Beauty for Women of Color. So again, have a great day. Enjoy the weekend coming up. And Dr. Tonk, the best. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a great weekend, everybody. You got it. Bye-bye. <laughs>